Now, um, welcome everyone to our uh, cultural assembly for the month of November. Um, a lot of people have worked really hard to uh, to put this together for all of you that, that are present and the and for those of you that are watching it in the classroom. So I am very grateful for all those people that are making this happening. Um, uh, first of all, um, we're, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the time to uh, Mr. Shadell, who's going to be doing the land and labor acknowledgement. We want to start our assembly by acknowledging that we are on the traditional lands of the Cowlitz tribe. We as settlers and as people who are not part of the First Nations or indigenous groups are residing on and benefiting from their land. The Cowlitz Indian tribe are the forever people who for generations have preserved living in harmony with the land and passing down traditions with pride. The Cowlitz people continue to remain connected to this land and they engage in cultural practices of old Cowlitz life, life ways such as smelt, salmon, and river ceremonies. They join many coastal tribes in canoe journeys. They drum and sing and are called upon for funerals, naming ceremonies, healing and celebrations. The Cowlitz people have weathered storms with honor and unity, holding tight to their independence and culture. But this is not simply a story of yesterday. It is a celebration of tomorrow and the unwavering Cowlitz spirit of all they have done and will continue to do, like the songs that mark the tribe's most important moments. It's, it is both relevant and triumphant. It is a reminder that the Cowlitz Indian tribe and the people on whose land we stand are the forever people. We never had a song for defeat. We also want to acknowledge that our nation has benefited from the free enslaved labor of black people. We honor the legacy of the African diaspora and black life. We honor the knowledge, skills, and human spirit that persevere in spite of violence and white supremacy. We commit to standing up against racism and acknowledging all facets of our life that black lives matter. Land and labor acknowledgments are a necessary step for us to name our country's past, express gratitude for the present, and take a minute to remember that we are on sacred ground, that each person, with each person connected to the other. The whole month of November, Native American Heritage Month, is a reminder to all of us that every day we have things to be grateful for. Our students and staff come here, have come to Fort from all across the globe. Out of all the places each of us could be right now, we are each right where we are supposed to be, here together at Fort Vancouver High School. It's really a beautiful thing, so I want to thank you all for being here today. Now let us put our hands together for Mr. Castro Quintanilla, who will introduce you to our first speaker and guest. Thank you. Our first speaker left such a great impression the last time that he was here so that we asked him to come back. Uh, Rodolfo Redstone Serna is an, an artist and a community advocate. He was born in Chicago, Illinois, but his roots are in Mexico. He follows in the tradition of his ancestor and share his art with the people. He has worked with youth from multiple organizations, including our um, Mecha uh, Club, the Latino uh, Leadership Northwest. Just yesterday, he was engaging in cultural creative connection panel at Fourth Plain Forward. Today, he is here to open this assembly for us in a native way, and we are so honored to have him here today. Let's give Rudy a quick round of applause and invite him to the stage. Gracias, gracias, thank you. Hola, buenos dias, good morning everyone. Ooh, we're tired this morning, huh? Buenos dias! I love it. Um, that's my, uh, my family, my roots are from Mexico, but my tribes are Huichol and Guachichile. A lot of us who are from uh, Latin American countries, we don't realize it, whether we're from uh, the Caribbean and you're really Taino, 
or whether you're from uh, Guatemala and you're really Mayan, uh, whether you're from further down south and the roots from the Pacific Islands all around Turtle Island. That's what we call this, North and South America. America is not a word that we had here before. So these lands belong to the indigenous people here, specifically the Cowlitz people and the Grand Ronde right across the road. Uh, these are very special places that, for me, when I came here, I fell in love, and I knew that this was going to become my home. I was actually born in Chicago. I grew up very different. Um, I didn't realize that I was Native. I didn't realize that I had those roots that I could be proud of, that I could lean on. In fact, I thought, if anything, I'm Spaniard. But that didn't make sense, right, because I ain't white. But there was something there confusing, right? And then I came to find a medicine man, un curandero and a chief, a capitan, who taught me the old ways. And these old ways are what kind of brought me back to, well, to being myself. For a long time, I thought I was supposed to be all these other things, and especially as a teenager, we have that pressure, what we're supposed to be. And then we don't look like everyone, so how does that even work? Well, for a lot of us, the work means having to go back and talk to our parents, our grandparents, and asking, hey, are we native? Do we speak a different language? Where do these foods come from? Because the truth of the matter is, all of you that I see in front of me that have that kind of look that I have, we're indigenous, guys. And so this is the new generation that not only recognizes that, but is going to do something about that. I believe in that. They say it took seven generations for the hoop to be uh, uh, mended. Seven generations ago, things became unbalanced. That means 500 years ago, guys. That's when the Europeans came. They'll try to make you believe that we were savages and all this crazy stuff. But when Cortez first came and he saw what the Aztecs were doing, he said, I am a world traveler and I've never seen anything like this. The, the streets are clean. They're beautiful. Everyone has a role. This is amazing. I've never seen anything like this. And this was just one part of this beautiful Turtle Island. My uncle, my chief, my captain, my tío, my familia, he's a Lakota. And he has a story that he tells from his family that a long time ago that the people were starving and that they were, they were very scared. They thought they were going to die. And so they sent out their greatest warriors to find food. And when they came across all the lands and found no buffalo, found no fruit, they thought that they were going to die. So they sent out their warriors one last time. And the last two were out there. And they found something. They found a light. And they went towards it. And then across, over the hills, it was a woman. And it was the sacred buffalo calf pipe woman. They didn't know who she was. One of the warriors looks over at the other one and says, I'm going to take that. That's mine. I'm going to run down there and she's mine. And the other warrior said, hold on, slow down. And he just charged down. And when he charged down, he was about to grab her. He turned into dust. She was the sacred one, the one that was going to bring us our traditional ways, the songs, the ceremonies that would help us. And they gave us a ceremony called the chanupa, the sacred pipe. And when we smoke this pipe, all the things that we need, they come to us. And this is what she gave the people. And the people survived. And so my uncle, my chief, he's around, and he teaches these stories, and he teaches these ways, and the ceremonies. You guys, there's so many ceremonies, not only from the native people up here, but from down in Mexico that, man, I can't wait till you guys get to experience. And I'm talking about, like, some of them are kind of crazy, but they're all beautiful, and they all belong to you guys. When you're ready for those ceremonies, you just ask for it. You put yourself out there, say you want some of that. And whether it's a, a huichol from Mexico who's going to introduce you to the peyote ceremony or whether it's a Lakota people who's going to introduce you to a sweat lodge, these are things of our ancestors. These are very different than what exists today. And the way we're going to balance out the world is by bringing back those customs. This isn't for everyone, but it's for everyone. They say ceremony belongs to the people, not any one people. They say when you do ceremony, you're trying to become a human being, not an Indian. And so for the human beings, those people that love and respect the earth, respect each other. That's what these ways are for. And so 
Uh, my name is Redstone Inyan Luta, and I'm here for you guys. That's my role as my chief and uncle, my medicine man. My medicine man, God bless his soul, he passed during COVID. My chief is barely hanging in there. You guys, I didn't want to take on the responsibility, but my chief said, I can't do it anymore. If anyone's going to do it, it's going to be you. And man, did I feel the pressure. <laughs> but I'm here for you guys. And uh, it doesn't have to be today, tomorrow. It could be years down the road. But know that there's people who hold your heritage as very sacred and very valuable. And I'm doing everything I can to hold on to those. So when you're ready, it'll be there for you. I want to close with a traditional song. This is a Wopila song. This is a thank you song. These songs are thousands of years old. They're used in our ceremonies. But in this case, it's a song from my heart to yours. And it's a way to say thank you, I hope. I just want to say one last thing. I'm really proud of uh, my friends that have come to share their culture as well. I have a friend here who's going to be presenting, uh, Ambrose Mianis. Uh He's a Warm Springs guy. He's, his tribe is from here, from Oregon. Or, excuse me, from Oregon. Uh, we're in Washington. Uh, my family is from Mexico, but he's uh, someone that I have so much uh, love and respect for, and I've seen him grow into this role that... We're culture bearers. We have to carry these traditions alive. And he's doing it for his friends and his community. And he's also doing it for his own family. And you guys are going to get to see a young person who has finally taken on that role. Uh, it's always a blessing when we see the little ones do it. So he's also one of my students from Portland. And uh, just really proud of them. I hope you guys enjoy them. hope you guys enjoyed that song. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys and continuing to work with you all. Uh, have a, a beautiful day. Thank you, Rudy, for the, your, your story and your words of wisdom. Um, next, um, students, we have our, our, our very own um, MMPI um, club performing. So we have our Micronesian, Melanesian, and Polynesian Pacific Islander Club performing two numbers from the Pacific Islands. The first dance is uh, from the Kingdom of Tonga, and the second one dances from Samoa. Mixed in between, you will see truly unique and creative modern uh, island dances that the students choreographed themselves. Um, let's give a warm welcome to our MMPI dancers and cue the music. Thank you. 
I man as a bedroom bully, bedroom bully for the girl picking it. I man as a bedroom bully, bedroom bully for the girl picking it. Bully, pull top girl is man a bedroom bully, bedroom bully for the girl picking it. I man as a bedroom bully, every girl is a telly girl. We could do a lot better than that. Come on, let's give a warm, yeah, yeah.
Our next speaker is someone that you may, uh, may already know. Um, how well do you know he, um, do you know this science and avid teacher? Do you know that his family's history and where he, he and his ancestors have been? Our very own Mr. James Sidenstrom of the Kalapuya, um, of the Confederate tribes of Silas Indian, he's going to share his journey with us and some things that he has learned along the way from the generations that come before him to the generations that raised him and continue through the generations that follow him now. Let's welcome Mr. James Sidenstrom to the stage. Kapai. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to follow that, but we're going to go for it here. This is low. Sorry. Um, first off, I want to start with a, a question that's been posed. What are you? Uh, hold on real quick. Um, second period. I don't know where the camera is or whatever, but uh, hey, uh, your labs are due tomorrow, the enzyme labs, so make sure you get that taken care of. Okay. Um, but anyhow, uh, <clears throat> my apology. Um, what are you? Um, this is a question that I've gotten over and over again for the last 30 years. Um, and I bet uh, my mom has been getting that question uh, on behalf of me for more than 40 years. And so I, I do want to recognize uh, Grandma Juju over here, who brought uh, our two kids, uh, BL and Charlie Joy over there. Also, not to forget uh, my baby mama, <laughs> Miss Russell over there. <laughs> um, all right, so back to that original question of uh, what are you? Um, as I've, as I've gotten older and I've heard that question, I, I know what people mean when they say that, what are you? Um, and the more I think about it, the, the real depth I see in that question and what it means. Um, so, I mean, am I native? Am I white? Am I Kalapuya? Am I I'm Irish? Um, is it my name? Is it Cedarstrom? My name, Cedarstrom, is Swedish. Um, Perhaps it's more than just race or my ethnicity, it's how I identify myself. Um, I'm, a, I'm a father, I'm a partner, a son, a friend, a teacher, or maybe just a person. Um, so if I'm not really answering that question, why am I, why am I up here? Uh, it seems to be my thesis statement of my whole thing, but I'm not going to answer that question uh, because of the uh, complexity of that. But I do want to share with you um, how I identify as a native person um, and, and some of my own experiences. Um, I'm, I'm Yonkala Kalapuya. Um, and up here you can see um, the shorter gentleman there. That's Kamafima. He's the head man of the Splokta'ala village uh, near present day Yonkala. That's my great, great, great grandfather. And then right next to him, that's. His son, B.L., who my son B.L. Has, has been named after and, is, and carries that name with him. Um, so with that, that makes me Kalapuya, but, but that's not really the, the, the full story of, uh, of, of me as a native person. Um, as you look up there, um, for multiple reasons, settlers coming to Europe, uh, wanted access to the Willamette Valley and how bountiful it was. Um, so they begin the process of moving, forcibly moving people from their homelands in Western Oregon. Uh, you can see up at the top uh, with the map with the yellow, that's originally where the Kalapuya were throughout the uh, Willamette Valley. Um, but by 1866, uh, the majority of people had been moved from their homeland to different reservations across Western Oregon. Um, uh, and so those here, you can see the nine federally recognized tribes um, on that map where different people were moved. And many times these people were moved from their homelands, separated from family and other people in their tribe to their different respective reservations. Some Kalapuya went to uh, the Siletz Reservation, while other 
Kalapuya went to Grand Ronde Reservation and different places across Oregon. So yes, I'm Yonkala Kalapuya, but according to the government, I'm enrolled member number 3734 in the Confederated Tribes of Sluts Indians with a blood quantum of one-eighth, whatever that means. Um, but you know, I'm also Multnomah, Alsi, Choctaw, Coos, Irish-German, maybe a little French, are all mixed in there. Um, and so what that means, though, since I'm enrolled as an eighth, that means my grandkids aren't going to be able to be enrolled in the Confederated Tribes. Um, but so what will they be? And so that, 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 that's that question that comes back to me. And so I just want to encourage everyone out there is to think for yourself of that original question is, what are you, and, and what does that mean for you and, and, and your, your place and, and your heritage and everything about you? Um, so uh, with that said, I would like to invite our students up to kind of share some of their experience and how they might answer that question and, and their identity. So please, a round of applause for our students here. <laughs> Well, I'll introduce the questions. Okay. All right, so we're going to have a circle discussion where we're kind of sharing some of our own experiences and our thoughts. Um, so just to get us started, can you tell us about your, yourself uh, and the people and places you come from? So my name is Ahmad, and I'm from Syria. I'm a senior at Fort Vancouver High School, and both of my parents are from Syria. Hi everybody, my name is Alyssa Gogui. I'm a senior here at Fort Vancouver High School. I identify as a Filipino Chamorro female. Both of my parents grew up from Guam and I was raised in Hawaii, so I was kept very much in touch with my culture. Um, Filipinos are citizens or people identified with the country of the Philippines and Chamorros are the members of the indigenous people of the Mariana Islands, inclu including Guam. Um, we hold very high values of togetherness and respect and these are the values that I live by um, in my day-to-day -day life. Hi, my name is Talia Mejia. I'm a senior. My family comes from Mexico. My dad's side comes from Oaxaca, and my mom's side is from Veracruz. Hi, my name is Fernando Gonzalez. I'm here, a senior at four. My family comes from Mexico, Puebla, to be specific, and yeah. Hi, my name is Uzman. I'm a senior at Ford. My, both my parents are from Gambia. Uh, I want to thank you all first to be here. We appreciate you. Then my name is Adam. I'm junior here in Fort Vancouver High School. I'm Syrian. I'm, bu I'm your Syrian. I was born in Syria. My name is Fatu. I'm, I'm a sophomore here. I was born in Burkama, which is in Gambia, also located in West Africa. My family comes from a noble clan called Bojan Sankaranka, which has its roots from the Mali Empire. My name is Zoe Heno, and I am a senior here at Fort Vancouver High School. My family and I are from the small island of Palau, which is located on the southwest corner of Micronesia. My mom is from the state I'm a league, and my dad is from the state Belilio. Ali Nunitutau, which is hello, good morning in Palauan. My name is Macy, and I'm a sophomore here at Fort Vancouver High School. Both of my parents come from the island of Palau. My dad is from the village Olay in Nerolong, and my mom is from Nerebeth, Orior, and Belilio.
Hello, I'm Georgie. I'm a senior at Fort Vancouver High School. Um, both my parents are Tongan, and uh, my family's from Nuku Nuku and Otea. My name is Brina. I'm a senior at Fort Vancouver High School. Both my families come from Western and American Samoa. My father is from Masifau, in the village of Masifau, and my mom's from the village of Waimoso. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm a senior year at Fort Vancouver High School, and uh, I came from American Samoa. Uh, I grew up in a village of Kapukimu. We call the Tap Boys. And my mom is from uh, Aloao, that's on the mountain. Okay, there he goes. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, so I kind of spoke about me as Kalapuya. The Kalapuya language is no longer spoken. The last speaker of the Kalapuya language died in the, in the 50s, um, which all with language and, and what that means uh, and what you lose when you lose a language is, is a great loss. Um, so I would like to ask some of our students here to share how is a language a part of your culture at home and at school? Uh, that's very different. At home, we have to change out because when I come to school, I'm a whole different person. Like I grew up here, you know, I grew up in America, Samoa. But when I go home, uh, I have to speak the language. And if I don't speak the language back, like if they're going to speak Samoa and I'm going to speak English to them, I get a slap. Um, but it's different. It's like we got to do a lot of chores, you know, keep the culture going, like show the respect at home so we can show respect in other, other houses. Uh, um, I was born in America, so unfortunately I didn't get to really be fluent in, um, back at home. So in order for us to keep the culture going, it was a, it was a mandatory thing where in a, at home, at church, or anywhere I go, um, I had to speak Samoan. Uh, my mom always told us that there was no such thing as an English in this house. So <laughs> we always had to speak Samoan. And it's, it was another way to understand other people. So, um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's definitely different at school. I had to speak more English than at home. But uh, growing up, I didn't have problems uh, figuring out my my language because uh, my parents would speak it to me. I would learn it at church. Um, whenever I went to visit family, it was easy to pick it up. The language I speak at home is Mandinka. We cherish our language and it's been a part of our culture for centuries. And at school, I wouldn't really speak it because there's not that many Gumbians that I can speak to with. The language that I speak at home is Arabic, especially Syrian dialect. And I must keep speaking it because it's my legacy. I must teach it to my kids. Oh, the language I speak at home is Haram Khule. It's spoken by three million people in numerous parts of West Africa. Uh, the language I speak at home is Spanish, Maya, and very little Nahuatl. But, uh, Maya is very important to me because not that many people speak it, and it's really important to me. The language I speak at home is Spanish, but coming down from my mom's side, they speak Mixteco and my ancestors. It is very rare to find people to speak Mixteco since I don't, but it just keeps on going. The language we speak at home is Arabic. We don't, everybody said we don't, their parents don't allow them to speak English at home. Neither does my parents because they want me to remember the language. They don't want me to forget about it. But when I come to school here, I have to speak English with all my friends. I try to speak Arabic as much as I can with other people that do. So, yeah. All right, thank you, everyone. And uh, just kind of a note, could we hold our applause for the individuals till afterwards so we can kind of get through that? <laughs>
Appreciate it. Uh oh, you can't see Tom very well. Oh, there we go. Uh, <coughs> all right. <coughs> uh, this is uh, Tom. Uh, so in the late 1800s, uh, a common practice in the United States was for uh, young native people to be sent to boarding schools. Um, and this is one of the one of the largest boarding schools at the time is was the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, and the motto of the founder of that was uh, "Kill the Indian to save the man." Um, and so what we see here is three years after Tom left the Carlisle Indian uh, School, um, and so kind of asked our students, "What do you what do you see has happened to Tom after three years in school, and what words or feelings come up for you?" Well, looking at these images. Um I know some of us have probably seen these in our history classes, um, what looks like to be a very, very big transformation from being in touch with this culture to having to live by the American standards um, in his new environment. And I think these spark really, really great feeling um, towards this type of issue and, yeah. Uh, what I see in Tom is that he's a victim of cultural genocide as he was stripped of his uh, cultural identity and was forced to become an American? Me personally, personally, I would think that it's disrespectful to um, strip somebody's culture from them. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, my now. Um, me personally, I kind of relate to this when I came here to uh, America. Uh, I remember wearing one, uh, ear, ear for Congo, it's like this, ear, this ear, where's the school? Kids came up to me, is that a skirt? I looked at them, just, sure. Anyways, uh, when I look at this photo, um, it's like, they, it's like when we learn new things, <coughs> excuse me, when we learn new things, we start like, to change, change personalities, change how we dress, I can't assume that because it took three years. I can't assume anything, you know. But it's, it's possible that he got stripped by, you know, the people that stripped him. And he became an American, I think. But, yeah. All right, thank you for everyone for sharing. All right, uh, what does unity mean to you and what does it look like? What do you think helps to bring more unity at our school? Um, unity to me, personally, it means as one. Everyone combine, race don't matter, as long as you come together as one, help each other out. That's it. Um, unity, um, a definition is, um, our MMPI club, we changed our name due to everyone thought Islanders was a one thing. But in the background of it, we all come from different cultures and different backgrounds. But as one, we all share the same ocean. So as that, I use that as a, a definition of unity, that we all come from different backgrounds, different race. Uh, we were all brought up different ways, but we all come together as one, and it's such a beautiful thing. Unity means to me an amount of people that come along together without having any judge around others and just respect and just always keeping being on the person who they are. Unity, mean, uh, unity to me means um, as a whole and coming together as one. This should look like forming connections regardless of identity or background, and unity should be the representation of a very diverse community as one. All right, so unity to me is just standing as one, and no matter the race, the color, where we come from, we just stand as one. All right, thank you very much. 
All right, words f from elders. Uh, in a lot of indigenous cultures, uh, el the value of elders is unlimited. Um, what are some words to live by that have been passed on to you by an elder in your family? So from my, so from my parents and my grandparents, they always told me, be you, don't change for other people, or to be, to come at, like, to fit in with other people, so. So a word from my grandmother has been, nunca cambies tus raíces y siempre sé orgulloso de tus antepasados, which means um, to never be ashamed of your roots and always be proud of your ancestors. Um, a word from my elders is siempre tener integridad, which means always have integrity. Uh, it's pretty important to me. My father keeps telling me that I have to be careful in relationship with the people because not all the people are the same. Um, some words from my parents are to have forgiveness and to have respect for your elders. My mom often tells me, which translates to, you can leave Palau, but Palau won't leave you. I feel like this goes for everyone no matter where you're from. Don't forget your culture. Um, bring it with you no matter where you go. Some words that I live by that my elders told me is mengul and shugauk, which translates to respect and culture. Always have respect for everyone no matter how old or how young, and that family would always come first. Uh, something I always heard growing up is manatu uh, kiapi, which means to remember your home. And uh, I just hold this very close to my heart because I always remember where I'm from and the people that uh, grown me up to how I am today. Um, well, my uh, grandma always told me, if I'm more I just put God first. And the other thing they told me is, I work in Ngalo don't forget the family. No matter what we got in our hands, remember the people that raised you from the start. All right, any final thoughts we have? I just want to say thank you for all our student presenters. Um, and I, I hope everyone understands and knows how difficult and challenging it is and scary to get up in front of a lot of people and kind of share your own personal experiences. Some of the things that are the most important and valuable to you that you find so true, yet to share that with a, l a large group becomes is, is a very scary thing. So I want everyone to recognize the bravery that all of our student uh, panel has shared with us and, and shown. So thank you very much. So now, big round of applause. And so just give us one more opportunity if you would like to share some any final thoughts or last words of wisdom you have. Um, my last words, wisdom and advice, is uh, don't, don't give up. You know, you, can, you feel like you're going to give up sometimes, but you got to know your purpose and what you're fighting for. Um, final words are, let this um, assembly be an example of, or a lesson to you guys that um, there's so much culture groups if you're interested in joining anyone, join them, and that you're not alone. There's always everybody around. You just got to keep looking. Uh, I just want to say, like, a lot of the times, uh, Polynesians and just Pacific Islanders in general, they're put in a kind of like stereotype that we can't succeed or go beyond this just to graduate even. Uh, I just wanted you guys to know that you can do whatever you want, no matter where you come from. Um, a message I would like to share with the Ford community is thank you as we take the time today to celebrate the diversity of our students and staff and fostering unity by embracing different cultures, backgrounds, and perspectives.
I do want to say that everyone you pass by in the halls has a different story, a different cultural background, and different struggles. Be kind and be tolerant and be patient no matter how hard it is, and only then will Fort truly be united. Um, my final thoughts are to join a cultural club if you have the opportunity to so you can be connected more to the school. My words are always thank you, God, for the life you are living now. As we always say, alhamdulillah, it means thanks, God. Uh, don't lose your cultural identity. Be proud of your culture and don't be afraid to show off your culture. My name is um, always put other people into consideration. My final words are to every one of us has a different kind of definition of who they want to be. It doesn't matter where they come from or what color it is, just be yourself. Um, my final words are never lose touch with who you are. And like Georgie said, remember where you come from. Secondly, form new connections. You may be an inspiration to the people sitting right next to you. And you um, should keep that in mind as you pass by people of different backgrounds and identities in the hallways. Um, it never hurts to learn new things. My final words are don't forget who you are and be proud of your culture. Thank you, everyone. Big, hey, big round of applause for our students. Thank you. Hey, students, please have a seat. We have one more number to close our celebration for today. So just uh, stay tight for a little bit longer. We're almost there. We would like to welcome Ambrose and his son to the stage, and this will be our concluding. Let's give him a round of applause. Hello, everybody. My name is Ambrose, and this is my son, Evan Mianis. And we're going to be doing an uh, honor song. And my son's going to uh, um, kind of do like a small grand entry kind of thing. He's going to come from behind the curtains and he's going to dance in a circle while I sing. And uh, if you'd like, uh, during the song, if you could all rise and remove your hats.
Thank you, Ambrose. Um, you, um, if you were one of the participants in the assembly, please make sure you come back to the stage. We're gonna get a photo, students, uh, the participant in the panel as well. Um, the rest of the students, you will be going to third period. You will have five minutes to transition to your next class. Uh, thank you, pat yourself on the back because you did a wonderful job here, so thank you. Third period, third period, we're transitioning to third period.